Welcome to Chapter 4, Functions and Program Structure. In this chapter, we're going to start digging a little deeper. Part of the goal of this course is to get you to the point where we can talk about how things really work. Eventually, in the next course, we'll even go down to hardware, hardware and architecture and gates. And so it's, it's time to start opening things up and looking at how things work. And so this is a good time to do so. And the big thing we're going to learn, among other things, is the concept of a stack. How pass-by-reference works, how, how pass-by-value and pass-by-reference work, a little bit about recursion. Recursion's a, a, a thing that I worry about a lot. Um, well, we'll get there. And a preprocessor. So these are all things where we're really starting. It's, I'm not just, it's not so much about just how functions work, but how functions are implemented and how that affects how they work. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is a really nifty computer science concept called a stack. A stack is a data structure that we use and it has a couple of attributes. The idea of a stack is we we start with an empty stack and we put things on the stack and then we take things off. When we take them off, the last thing we took put on is the first thing we get off and they go up and they go down you can push things onto them and take things off of them. We can approximate this with a Python list. So we start with an empty list, we append the string 1 to it, and the stack has a 1 on it. It's kind of growing up from the bottom, and it's going to shrink from the top. And then we append a 2 to it, and then we, our stack is now 1 and 2. So the bottom thing in the stack is 1, and the top one is 2. And then we append a 3 to it, and we have 1, 2, 3 on the stack. At that point, we pop. Pop says, Give me the most recent pushed thing and then take it off. So we pop off three and the stack remains with one and two. Again, this is also known as a last in, first out, or LIFO queue. A queue is like a line of things. And so the, the last thing in is the first thing you got out. So that's a stack. And we're going to use stacks in function calls. So historically, when we talk about call by value and call by reference, we basically say that call by value means that Somehow this value, like in the main program MA with a variable with a value 42, ends up being copied into the function and the parameter OP has got, a, has got a copy of the 42. It's not the original MA, it's the copy of 42. So 42 gets passed in the function 1 and OP is a copy of 42. So then inside the function we can subtract 10 from it and then we can see that, but then when we get back in the main function, we see that MA has been unchanged. And it's like, oh, we build a little wall around the function and nothing inside the function happens. The outside world is unaffected by it. And that's a great oversimplification of call by value. Of course, call by reference means the stuff you do in this function can affect outside the function. But let's talk a little bit about how a stack is used to accomplish this. So just to use some terminology, C calls these variables that are allocated inside the function be before the function starts as the automatic variables. And frankly, int ma equals 42 in main is an automatic variable inside the main because main is a function inside a C program that happens to be the one that starts everything out. So if we get to the point where it says int ma equals 42 and then it prints ma being 42, at that point on the stack, the C runtime has allocated one integer and we've assigned 42 to it. So that's what the stack looks like at that first print statement in main. Then we call the function 1 and pass MA in. And this is where the C runtime library, kind of before everything starts out in the function 1, it allocates what's called a stack frame. And a stack frame includes the parameters, OP, and the automatic variables that are inside of that function. And so in this case, we're going to get two variables. We're going to get OP as an integer and TN as an integer. And before the program starts up, the value 42 is copied from MA into OP. And so the stack frame is the context in which that function operates. So when it first starts, you see that OP has 42. You also see we have two copies of the number 42. And we have a parameter, OP, and then we have the, the automatic variable, the TN. Then the next line runs, okay? 
And at that point, OP is changed. OP equals OP minus TN. And so OP becomes 32. But you'll notice that on the stack, out beyond the stack frame, the stack frame is our current execution of the function 1. Beyond the stack frame, the 42 is still there. We can't see it. We're, we're in the function right now, and we're only seeing the top part of the stack. We're not seeing the part of the stack that belongs to the main program. So that's where it prints out 32. So 32 in the function says OP is 32, and that's fine. And then we return, and that's when the C runtime removes the stack frame, pops those things off the stack. It remembers how much it put on, and it pops all the stuff off the stack that it put on, and then it basically comes back into MA, and the stack frame for the main program has one variable in it, and it's MA, and it has 42, and that's because one operated in its stack frame, and now the main program is back to operating in the same stack frame. You can almost think of this as like one never happened, right? From main's perspective, it had some variables. One ran, and a stack frame was created. Some of the main data was copied into the one stack frame. One operated in its stack frame, and then the stack frame went away right before one, or right at the moment that one returned, and the return value ends up in the stack frame too. I just haven't shown you that, and these don't send return values. So the, the return value comes back uh, from the stack frame. But you can see how main started with the stack with one one variable on it, and then it one ran, and all that stuff happened, and then it kind of was undone, and that's where the changed variable just kind of went away. And so the stack, it's as if nothing ever happened, except it went up, and then it went back down. Now one thing we notice, and, and in Python we see this too, where you say everything is called by value, which implies a copy, um, except for things like certain objects and calling methods and objects. And if, but if you look at, say, this function zap, and we pass in x, and x is, starts out as original, and then it calls the zap function, and it passes in, and it's got the original, then it gets changed inside the, inside the zap function, and that change uh, prints out. But then when it comes back, it is back to the original. So x is back to the original in the main code. And you might say, oh, that looks right. And that, that's actually quite intuitive in that, that, that Python has made it so a call by value inside of this, uh, inside, a call by value to the zap function, it happened, meaning that nothing, cha nothing changed outside of the zap function, and it was a call by value, not a call by reference. Now, I'm not going to go into it, at least not right now, talking about why that really worked. And it's, it's less about call by value and call by reference and more about the fact that y is really a pointer to an object, and when y equals changed executes inside of zap, the object pointer, it points to a different object, and then, but x never changed. And so Python has a slightly different runtime, but it leads to this notion that seems like a string variable in Python is call by value. Now, if we look at the similar but quite different code inside of C, we see the main has a, a, a character array x of unknown length, which is original, and that just unknown length means that it says it's uh, looks like eight characters plus a backslash zero, which is nine characters, and it prints out kind of like a string. It's a character array with a terminator, and then we call zap, pass x in, and then inside of zap, zap takes a character array as its parameter, and it can print out the word original when it starts, and then it copies changed into it, and then it says at the end, it's, it's the, the y is at the end is changed, but then we come back, and back in the main program, it got changed. So does that mean it was called by reference, or what? And the answer is sort of, and this is where it kind of helps. So it turns out that when you are passing an array into a function in C, you're not actually passing the contents of the array. So most of the time we think of that 42 being copied if it's an integer, if it's just like a scalar thing like a float or an int or a char or something, that's being copied. But when you have an array, that could be gigantic. So it doesn't actually copy in the whole array. So when x is being passed into zap and being received as y, we're not actually passing the string, because that could be a million characters for all we know. So it's not like it makes an extra copy of a million characters. 
what it's doing is it's passing in the address of the start of the string, not on the stack, but somewhere else. It actually could be on the stack somewhere, but it's not in the stack frame and the word original is not copied into the stack frame. The stack frame only includes a pointer or the address. X is the address of the letter O, and then Y is also the address of the letter O, which means when we're calling str copy, we are overwriting those characters. Oh, and by the way, I carefully made sure that the string changed was shorter than the string original, or my program could have blown up because this is C and arrays don't get bigger. Python strings get bigger, but arrays don't. In a couple more lectures, we will build a data structure where it's like a Python string and we can add to it and you'll see that the code is very complex. A character array is very simple, okay? And so it's not exactly a pass by reference. It is a pass by location. And if you happen to misuse that location, meaning you write to that location, you write to the location. Now this might have been in like read-only memory something, your program might have blown up. So you better be sure what you're doing when you start messing inside of a function with an array that's been passed to you. Now sometimes you're supposed to. Sometimes we tell you to write that. Another thing that you're gonna see in this is the reference to register variables. Uh, this is another rather historical notion. And in my opinion, it really had to do with uh, convincing uh, really skilled assembly language programmers that they could get the same performance out of C that they were used to getting inside assembly language. And so what are registers? Well, when you have a central processing unit and you have memory, the data lives in the memory and the registers live in the central processing unit. And depending on the speed of things, a register might be, you know, 40 times faster than regular memory. And so if you could keep a variable like i in a loop, you could keep that in a register that's faster. And so what we can do with saying register int x is say, hey, by the way, next few lines, x is a really important variable and I expect to use it a lot. So if you can possibly not store this in memory, please do so. And that's why the only kind of weird thing about the register is you can't get the memory address of a register variable. Now, in modern compilers, we have runtime optimizers that are miraculous. I mean, they border on miraculous. Even the simplest of runtime optimizers that speed the code up at runtime are miraculous. And saying this is a register or that's a register might actually confuse things. So all the register does is, hey, I am never going to ask you the address of this variable, so don't bother putting it in memory if you don't feel like it. Okay, and so it's, it's probably... But I, I also think it's kind of fascinating and fun to think about this. Think about how early C developers were so deeply connected to their assembly language that is at the runtime. Uh, recursion, 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 recursion. When a function calls itself, it's called recursion. It's a powerful, it's a beautiful concept. There is places when if you're given a tree-like structure, like you parse some XML or something and you're reading through the XML, Recursion is such a pretty way to write code. I'm about to show you a very simple recursion example that are two things. First, they're really inefficient and silly uses of recursion, and they mislead you as to why you should use recursion. And they misleadingly kind of tell you that like, recursion is great, let's use it for something it doesn't e is not well used for. So, so really in this section, I'm not trying to show you what recursion is used for well. I'm more interested in giving you a really artificial synthetic example to show how the call stack works and how recursion works with the call stack. So here we have, I mean some tortured code. It is not pretty code. This is a, I'm, I'm writing code that if given a number like uh, three, adds up one plus two plus three. Okay, and gives me six. There are so many ways to do this. There's even a closed form solution that doesn't even require a loop. That's called algebra. But we're going to use recursion. So if you look at the int main, I'm gonna say sum up three. That means sum up things one, two, three. So sum up is being called from main and then I've got the return value and I say sup. And you'll notice in the printout that sup is the very last thing that comes out. 
And so if you walk through sum up, you see that there is a parameter called above that's coming, I call that above because it's coming from whoever's calling us. There's a parameter below, which is we're gonna compute a value and send it down to the next copy of ourselves down. And then sum is the sum of the, the above value and the sum of the below values. And then retval is, I mean, actually sum is just coming back from the call to ourselves. And then retval is adding those two things together. And I do this in exceedingly slow motion with print statements everywhere that just makes this look ugly because really the only thing that matters is where it says sum equals sum up below. And what we're doing is we're calling the same function again. So if you look in main and you see the sum up call, that is going to create a stack frame. And in that stack frame, it's gonna have a, whatever the three number is, we're gonna make an above variable, copy three into the above variable and allocate a below sum and retval. So our stack frame is gonna have four integers on it. And then the function starts working. And the way the rate recursion works is there's always got to be a, a time at which it stops. This is kind of like going down, 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 and then it has to work its way back up. If it goes down forever, that's called a stack overflow, and then your computer runs out of memory and your application blows up. So you know, have to have a time at which the stack uh, algorithm stops. So what we're saying is if we're being told to sum up one or less, well, we define the sum of that as one. So we just return the sum of everything up to one as one, and that's our way of stopping the recursion at the bottom. And then what we do is we take below and we subtract one from it. So if we're being called with three, below becomes two. And so you see that over in the lower stack frame. Below is two, right? Below is two, and we're about to go down deeper into the call tree. And um, so we're gonna, we're gonna call sum equals sum up below. So what happens now is we're passing two in to another stack frame. And so there's not really a cop another copy of the code, but there's another stack frame. And so now we're calling sum up with two as the parameter. That's our below. But then we see the stack frame. And now this is the stack frame that's kind of on the left-hand side there. Above in this stack frame is two. And then execution begins and we subtract one from below. I, well, above is not less than one. So we subtract one and above uh, below becomes one because it's two minus one and we're going to go down. So it says down one, which means it's going to again say sum equals sum up below and below in this case is one. And so it ma makes another stack frame. There's a, um, so we're, we're actually, there is a maximum of like three calls here and then it's gonna work its way out. So then it calls another stack frame that's not shown on the right hand side and then it runs with one as above, and then above is less than or equal to one, so it returns one, and that's why it says in one, and it doesn't say anything because then it's returned, and it returned the value one. So now the third stack frame comes off, and now we're in the other stack frame, and sum is what the return value of the sum up call was, so it says back one, and then it says above, now we're, now we're in the stack frame that's on the right-hand side, so sum is one, Below is one, above is two, and so we compute retval, which is one plus two, and that's three, and we print that out, and that's kind of where the where we're indicating, and then we return the three, right? And then it returns retval, and then it runs some more, it gets three back, then it, it adds, the, adds the three to it, and returns one more time, and the stack all pops up, and eventually you get six. And this is a, I mean, you can look at this as long as you like. I don't, this code is like a foolish way to make this calculation, like most artificial recursion examples. But the key thing here is just think about the stack frame, right? Every time you call in, another stack frame happens. Call in, stack frame happens, and then when the return value happens, it goes back to that stack frame. So the stack frame is a way of pausing execution at the moment create a new stack frame, execute in that stack frame, and if you need to, have a yet another stack frame. And so this idea of creating a stack frame with the parameters and automatic variables each time you call a function, copying the parameters into that stack frame, and then executing the function in that stack frame. We're not making extra copies of the function, we are just creating a new stack frame. That's what the essence of recursion is, is the fact that you have a stack, and each call makes a stack frame, and if you recursively call again, you just make another stack frame. 
And so it's almost easier in my mind to think through how stack frames work than it is to think through how recursive code works. Now I want to talk a little bit about the C preprocessor. It's, it's the last thing of this chapter and it's in some ways orthogonal to functions and program structure. I mean it, it is part of program structure. And so I've talked a lot about how wonderfully the C compiler and eventually Unix solve so many problems of uh, software source code portability. And things like endianness and character arrays and masking and shifting not being necessary, those were awesome. But the problem was is that C has always operated in an environment. The language has changed. Uh, in the early days, it, uh, it wasn't standardized. By 84, it got standardized. ANSI C came out. A lot of people used it outside its original creation, and so a lot of things got fixed in the first decade of C's use. The language evolved a lot. The language kept, kept evolving, and a lot of the things that would make it evolve are things like integers went from 32 bits in some situations to 64 bits, and then you have to say, well, what is a long? Is long 64 or long 32? Because it started with int being 16 bits and long being 32, and then long was 64. Well, for a while, then ints were 32 and longs were 32, and then ints were 32 and longs were 64. And what would happen if ints were 64? And it had to do with computer architecture, 64 bits, right? And so sometimes you would have a bit of code and it just, what, you knew you wanted a 32-bit thing and you weren't sure if an int or a long or a short was going to give you 32. And so you had to say, you know, I really need different source code. Like if I'm working on a PDP 11, I got one thing, and if I'm working on Interdata 732, I want another thing, because really I want a 32-bit 32, a 32 integer. And now there's actually int 32 in some of these things, because you do need to know sometimes you're using 32-bit integer. Then libraries changed. There's calling sequences that changed, because again, as computers got bigger and bigger, and memory got bigger, and disk drives got bigger, you would be in a certain version of an operating system, and, and the, the calls to reading files might be slightly different. And so it's not really that the source code was portable, it's the, 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 the calling sequences to libraries started to change. Um, hardware evolved, operating systems evolved, C started running on non-Unix because C originally started on Unix, but then it quickly went to other operating systems because it was such a powerful concept. But sometimes in these other operating systems, just things were kind of different because they weren't working on Unix. And so the preprocessor really was a in effect, a way to patch your source code so that you could say, look, I, I wrote this source code 10 years ago and it worked on a PDP-11 and now I'm going to run this on an IBM 360 architecture and I don't want to change that. There's a few changes I need to make that have nothing to do with sort of the, what, the, what a for loop looks like, but it has to do with like what library I'm calling or what the return type for that library might be. So the preprocessor allowed us to put variations in the source code. And the preprocessor, it really feels weird because its, it's syntax, syntax is very different because the preprocessor is kind of a line-oriented processor and it has these pound things, right? These, these um, like pound if def, pound define, pound else, pound end if, and pound include. That's even a preprocessor. So what the preprocessor is, is a not a compiler at all. It is a source code to source code translator, it expands the include files, and then it makes changes. So in the top example where you see pound include stdio.h, you can actually run GCC minus capital E and it says just run the preprocessor and shows me what comes out. You take, you know, 10, 12 lines of code on the left and it puts out hundreds and hundreds of lines of code on the right. I'm only showing you a subset of it. But the biggest part is the fact that include stdio.h is literally expanded. And then that is C code without the pound include. Okay, so that's the preprocessor. But then another example here is I'm creating this use underscore long. This is not really a variable. This is a compiled time variable. So I'm going to create a new string called int underscore 32. And if use long has been defined, I'm going to make int 32 be a long. Else, I'm going to make int underscore 32 be an int. And again, this could be a thing where I'm compiling for different architectures and I want this variable IP address to be a 32-bit integer and I need it to work on different operating systems. 
So in this case, um, because use long is not defined, int 32 as a string substitution, like a macro string substitution before the compiler even does anything, turns int 32 into int. And so that's what the uh, five lines of pound if def and all that stuff do is it says change this int 32 string in my source code into int. And so what we see on the right is really C code. What we see on the left is kind of C preprocessor plus C code. And so the preprocessor transforms source code to source code. So I was looking around at some old code that I happened to have grabbed and put into uh, GitHub which was some code from 1994 from XMosaic 1.2. And for those of you who took my internet history, technology, and security, you know that XMosaic was the first web browser that was portable across multiple operating systems. And the more, and then eventually Mosaic ended up on uh, Unix systems with X Windows, that's why it's called XMosaic, and it went to the Mac and went to the PC. And so it was really many Unixes Mac and PC. And what we're seeing here on the right hand side is actual source code from that which was written in like 1993, 1994. And what you see is a bunch of if defs, in if and defs, and some comments and like there's a if def Solaris 9 broken. Um, and it has to do with like where do we find the error messages on this uh, across all these weird operating systems. Because the way they'd put error messages, sometimes they would use extern, which are global variables defined inside the runtime, and we would just look at those variables. We would make a function call, and it would write into these global variables. But then that global variable might be different. So this is actually from some code that was HTTP and C that was some early network connections. Now these days, you know, we just do this stuff in like the rec pound import requests in Python. But in those days, the C libraries for network connections were really different, meaning that they were just, you know, here comes the network, here's this language C, it's been around by, you know, 89, 90, 91. We were, the network was there, and so we were building libraries, but then how each library worked in each operating system was a little wonky. And so they had to write different C code to compensate for the different operating systems that this C program, a web browser, would be running on. And so all these if defs mean that one source code with a few predefined constants, compile time constants, could then work on a wide range of, of operating systems. And so yes, the C language itself is portability, portable, but we also want to be portable over time. And so sometimes library libraries change, operating systems change, um, and we want to be able to compensate for that. And so this is an important part of C. These days it's less important um, because a lot of the libraries have stabilized and they don't change quite so much. And so this code here would probably just be a bit of socket code and the errors would come back the same way no matter what version. Like um, VMS is an operating system that doesn't exist anymore. Think C it doesn't exist anymore. Next doesn't exist anymore. Solaris doesn't exist anymore. So these are all operating systems that don't even exist anymore. But this code was portable across all those things. And actually, I, I compiled all this, and you can kind of take a look at it. I made a, a video where I re resurrected this code. Uh, it's got to be eight or nine years ago on a Macintosh, which is an evolved from Next. I don't know if I could get it to work again, but back then I got it to work on a Macintosh, and I said, defined it as Next. And so I compiled this C code, and I, there's a, there wasn't there is an X Windows on Macintosh, so I got the X Windows library, I got all this stuff working, and I told it you're a next, and then I recompiled the C code, and eventually something came up, and I, I made a video about it, and so I, because I knew that it, it'd be very difficult to keep this thing working over time, but to go from 1994 to 2014, um, and recompile something in you know 20 years later. Uh, that's still pretty impressive that that next code would still work. Uh, things like the v VM code, VMS code, there's no VMS computers that I know of uh, these days. So it just, it just shows that the idea of, you know, portability is a, it, it, some of it is simple and elegant and was laid down in 1978, but then there are things outside the programming language that were evolving uh, and still are evolving to this day. And if you are doing 
uh, C coding today or C++ coding today, you may be using things that start with pound sign, which are compiler directives rather than um, C code. So with that, uh, dive into <laughs> chapter four and uh, learn about functions.